and it will be uh, jointly done by Mr. Paul Lambo, who is a PsyD uh, candidate at Pace University and a former valedictorian of St. Francis College, and myself. Right? And uh, according to legend, the Chinese consider themselves to be the descendants of the dragon, a symbol of ethnic identity, power, strength, achievement, and benign celestial power. So this is not a European nasty dragon, that's a uh, creature of heaven. Right? There are at least 650,000 immigrants of Chinese descent in New York City. And that makes it the largest, quote, Chinese city in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, most of these immigrants uh, actually came to New York City after 1967. So Chinatown used to be, and I mean Manhattan Chinatown, used to be a place with about 20,000 people. But then new immigration laws were passed in the United States and everything afterwards changed. Here you see uh, actually an adopted child right, with a Chinese and an American flag and that is really the topic we're looking at, namely how to be both a person of Chinese descent but also living in the United States and more specifically in New York City. Uh, we're going to discuss a few things, uh, very briefly background about the Chinese in New York City. And then we're going to discuss a research project, uh, an essay contest that uh, Jonathan and I did some years ago. And uh, we also have interviewed quite a few uh, persons of Chinese descent all in New York City. And then we're going to look briefly at the educational achievements, uh, which are quite impressive. And finally, a few uh, uh, conclusions. Here you see a map of China. And perhaps not surprisingly, most of the immigrants in New York City come from the southern eastern areas, originally from Taishan, not too far from Hong Kong, and in Guangdong province, and especially starting in the 1980s in Fujian province, but they also come from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, uh, from Malaysia, and so on and so on. Right? Here you see uh, sort of like a bird's eye view of New York City. The oldest Chinatown is Manhattan Chinatown that got really started seriously in the uh, 1880s. The second uh, big Chinatown, sometimes called Little Asia, is in Flushing. And it's called Little Asia because it isn't just Chinese, it's also Koreans, Bangladeshis, Indians, and so on. So it's a more mixed and more middle class uh, neighborhood. And starting actually around 1980, the third uh, Chinatown was founded in Brooklyn in Sunset Park. Right? It is now bigger than the Manhattan Chinatown, and as far as number of people is concerned, it's rivaling uh, the Flushing area these days. Right? Just a few pictures. Uh, you may know uh, this corner of Mott Street and Canal Street, sort of the center of the old Manhattan Chinatown. Uh, here we are on East Broadway, a very typical scene. Interestingly, the people that live on East Broadway mostly come from Fujian province, speak a different dialect than the original sort of old Chinatown Cantonese and Taishanese speakers. 
The next picture shows you uh, the flushing area, not far from the train station for the number seven train, sometimes called the Orient Express, ironically. And uh, that's an area that, uh, as I said before, is uh, uh, more mixed in terms of uh, where the people come from originally, or at least their uh, ancestors or parents, right? This is an unusual scene uh, taken in uh, Manhattan Roosevelt Park. You see a lot of little Chinese kids Right. Somewhat surprisingly, what the uh, gentleman in the foreground shows them are uh, pictures of the little Jesus child, because he's a missionary from Switzerland, of all places. You would never guess this. Right. And uh, the parents don't mind if uh, their kids uh, are exposed to this, even though the parents may be Buddhist, or maybe they don't follow any religion, or whatever. Right. Here we have a scene where a uh, lion, uh, during the New Year's festival, is visiting a shop. Right. And the lady is actually putting a sort of red envelope with money into the mouth of the lion. Right. And uh, this is taken inside uh, a uh, place not far from East Broadway. The way kids grow up in Chinatown varies in a lot. So that little boy here uh, obviously uh, gets quite a background in his Chinese culture, but pretty soon he will be in an American school and uh, probably become more or less bilingual. This is uh, a lion, so called, uh, actually originally from Staten Island, I believe. Right? And uh, if you ever want to have fun, go to the Chinese Lunar New Year's Parade, right? Uh, among the most interesting parades that we have in New York City. There are also parades out in uh, Flushing, right? uh, somewhat different from the uh, Manhattan Parade and also Brooklyn Chinatown. The Chinese differ from other immigrant groups in an interesting way, and these statistics are only applying to New York City. They're not countrywide statistics on purpose, because I'm going to discuss New York persons of Chinese descent, not Chinese um, immigrants in general around the country. Notice that a considerable percentage of the Chinese immigrants in New York City do not have a high school diploma. Right. And if you look at the postgraduate degree, uh, you also find that uh, it's rather less than, for instance, the Korean immigrants. So the Korean immigrants are more middle class, whereas Chinese immigrants vary a lot in social class, but quite a high percentage of them are really working class. When you look at the household income, again, it is clearly below that of whites. Uh, the poverty rate is somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. So about one quarter of all Chinese kids in New York City uh, grow up in uh, surprisingly difficult economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. Many of the parents and first uh, generation Chinese immigrants don't speak English or they speak it poorly. Right? So the way uh, Chinese Americans become Chinese Americans is in part through their children, right? who typically go to some American school and often will learn to speak English better than Chinese. The unemployment rate is pretty low, right? and uh, so that gives you just a very brief background. 
So, what are we going to discuss today? We're going to discuss some autobiographical essays by 82 high school and college students who basically spent their teenage years in New York City, right? So they are not, for instance, uh, foreign students at NYU or so, right? We also have what's called the sentence completion test. Then we have interviewed uh, quite a few Chinese Americans. And then we try to compare the results of these studies. Right. Before we look at the essay uh, contest, Mr. Palumbo is going to talk about one special group of uh, Chinese immigrants. And their situation is quite unusual. They're little kids that, uh, after they're born in uh, New York, are sent back home to Fujian province in China, and when they're around four, five, six, they come back to New York City. One moment. We're having some uh, PowerPoint problems here, so I'm just, for the moment, uh, continuing my part of the talk. Right. This uh, graph gives you sort of a summary of what one would have to look for if one wants to study Chinese Americans in uh, New York City. Of course, we can't do the whole thing, right? but you certainly would have to look at, on the one hand, the Chinese background, on the other hand, the uh, New York version of the uh, American immigrant situation, the parents, uh, certain legal situations, and so on and so on. So let us look at the essay contest. Right. Uh, this uh, essay contest was asking students of Chinese descent between uh, 14 and 24 to submit an autobiographical essay. They could choose any topic they like to, right, as long as it was about their personal situation. Right. And, of course, there were some uh, awards and so on and so on, and we ended up with uh, 82 essay writers, right? Uh, about two-thirds were from high school, about one-third uh, were college students, uh, three-quarters were written in English, uh, one-quarter written in Chinese, which we then translated into English, right? Uh, whenever you do voluntary work like this, you're going to get more female rather than uh, male respondents. And uh, the students attended 19 different high schools and 13 colleges. And that's important because it tells you that they weren't just from one or two specific schools or colleges. So even though one cannot claim that uh, the sample is exactly representative, it is certainly a sample that included writers from a broad variety of backgrounds. The writers included first uh, generation immigrants, that means they were born overseas. 1.5 generation immigrants, that means they were born overseas but came to the uh, New York City within the first uh, nine or 10 years of their lives. And second generation immigrants, that means they had Chinese parents, but they were actually born here in New York City. Right. Generally speaking, not very surprisingly, uh, the essays represent the experiences of uh, a very highly motivated group, right? 
And you're not going to expect that people who drop out of high school or whatever are going to submit an essay about their experiences, right? So it's not exactly a standard sample by widespread. Here are a few quotes right, that sort of gives you a feeling of uh, what we're talking about. The first two quotes come actually from a Chinese-American Nobel Prize winner who grew up in China in the 30s and 40s. And like many persons of rural backgrounds, his parents could neither uh, read nor write. Right? And because they couldn't read or write, they made huge sacrifices so that their children would be better off. Yeah, right? And that is a not at all atypical situation, especially for the earlier years, but in many ways still applies today. The Nobel Prize winner also says that he had this sort of Confucian ideology in his mind. The Confucian ideology puts education very, very high. In fact, China is probably the, uh, or was the most education-oriented society on Earth for many centuries. For instance, if you wanted to join the elite of China when it was still an empire, right, you uh, participated in a national uh, imperial examination and the percentage of students who passed was often 1% or less. Right? So it was an extremely tough uh, competition, but even if your background was that of a farmer or a little businessman or whatever, in principle you could join the upper class of China by doing well in this essay competition. The next quote is one of the students we uh, interviewed, right? and she tells us that her mother came to the United States not because she loved her husband, right? but it was what people call a green card marriage. Right? Why did she come to the United States? Not because of her, but for her daughter. Right? So she doesn't really love her husband, right? but uh, she feels she did the right thing because that would help her daughter to succeed. Next one. We're going to have a uh, main speaker today, uh, Dr. Kazinitz, and this is a quote from uh, one of his uh, books, which compares different immigrant groups in New York City. And of the eight groups that he's looking at, right, he says that Chinese children have moved farther than any other group in terms of their distance from their parents' occupation, in other words, their socially uh, upward mobile, educational levels, remember one third of the parents have not uh, graduated from high school, and even as far as their attitudes is concerned. Right? So it's a highly unusual group in, in that sense. And finally, well, there, there are two more quotes. One a very typical quote, uh, Asian parents are not that open, they're stricter. You should do well in school, that's your number one job as a kid, and nothing else is as important. Right? Wouldn't it be cool if the parents would be a little bit more relaxed? Right? Uh, the student incidentally has a Jewish boyfriend, right? and obviously has her foot in two cultures, uh, the Chinese and the American culture, and she has a sort of a American teenage uh, attitude towards certain things. This is from an essay, also rather typical. I don't think I was allowed to create my own identity. Everyone created it for me. I thought, maybe, if I wasn't Chinese, I would have been given more of a chance to be the person I wanted to be. 
In other words, Chinese parents often feel that they should regulate the lives of their kids to a, uh, a greater extent than will be typically found in sort of mainstream American families. On the one hand, that means they're successful in getting their kids uh, education oriented and so on. But on the other hand, uh, it is certainly not a story where the emphasis on is on choosing your own identity, which is sort of the American mainstream way of thinking about how you should uh, bring up kids. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about those essays. Uh, within some limits, the essay writers, remember 82 of them, could write what interested them about their growth in New York City. And here are six topics. They're not the only ones, but six important ones. So some wrote about what it meant for them to come to the United States and uh, how difficult that might be in terms of language, culture, attitudes, uh, finances, and so on and so on. A second big topic was, of course, family relations. And uh, most of these uh, essays focused on parent, child relations, siblings, uh, also sometimes on grandparents, because quite a few Chinese Americans are brought up uh, more by their grandparents than by their parents who might be working all day long. Right. Third topic, striving for academic success. Uh, topic number four, and rather difficult to read sometimes, being uh, discriminated against, being the subject of racial and other prejudice. Right. Number five, a big topic, economic hardship, living in very small and undesirable apartments, maybe in a neighborhood that was uh, not very good and uh, just sort of the family's struggle for survival. And finally, there was uh, quite a bit about gender roles, uh, gender-based discrimination in the family, negative body images, and that topic was especially salient in the essays of female writers. Okay, so let's first talk about uh, the family and community context. So some of the writers uh, described in their essays uh, how they came to the United States, uh, the difficult beginnings, but at the other hand, on the other hand, they were also quite happy about how their lives had worked out so far. Right? And they felt supported by the family atmosphere and mentor figures, right? uh, and uh, felt, yes, it started out difficult. Right? I didn't understand any uh, English, for instance, but ultimately uh, turned out to be well. For instance, one uh, female writer wrote about what it was like to be a six-year-old girl speaking Chinese only, being uh, taken by her mother for the first time in her life to an American school, not understanding a word, being introduced to her teacher, right? And then the mother left. I think anybody can imagine what that must be like for a six-year-old girl. Right? Nevertheless, things turned out well for her. Other stories, however, were less happy. Right? And some of the writers had a very mixed attitude, mixed feelings about Golden Mountain. That's a term Chinese immigrants used, uh, especially back in the 19th century. Uh, 
right? Uh, in some cases, because when the parents came to the United States, they thought the United States is rich, right? And surely we're going to do quite well financially, but the economic struggle uh, turned out to be very difficult indeed. Right. One important consideration is language. Right. Uh, there are many different so called dialects in Chinese. Some cannot be mutually understood. If you, sp you speak a Min dialect from Fujian province, the rest of China is not going to understand you. Right? Uh, these days, uh, most commonly people understand at least some Mandarin, the sort of the official language of China. Right? But if you come, let's say, from Hong Kong or Guangdong province, uh, it is likely that the language at home is uh, Cantonese, right? So there are many sub-ethnic differences within the Chinese community that outsiders are hardly aware of, and language is one problem. There are other problems, of course, uh, that make it difficult to uh, create connections uh, between these different sub-ethnic communities. Sometimes the writers would say, well, my parents, they don't really understand what's going on because they, the parents lived a totally different life originally. They're now working, often 60, 70 hours a week, right? And they don't really know what it's like to be a Chinese American. They live in a Chinese environment. Or they will say things like, yeah, I had all sorts of problems, but I didn't want to bother my parents. They have a lot of things to worry about on their own. Right? One key problem for some of these uh, families was that both of the parents worked many hours. Right? Sometimes, because when they came to uh, New York, they owed money to, uh, because they were smuggled in. Uh, there are quite a few persons of Chinese background here in New York City actually are smuggled in. The going rate uh, about 12 years ago was about $70,000, an absolute fortune. Right? So when they arrive here, they owe a lot of money. They don't owe the money to the smugglers, they have to be paid immediately, but they owe the money to relatives, people from the same village back in China. And the first thing they want to do is to work very hard so that they can pay off their debts, which means that they have a lot of problems uh, if they have a kid or two at home. Sometimes the kid is brought up by grandparents, but sometimes the kid is sent back to China. And Dr. Uh, Mr. Palumbo is going to say a little bit about these kids that are being sent back to China. So this is a uh, Fujian province in uh, the People's Republic of China. And so I'm just going to talk about a, a little bit about the fastest growing uh, group uh, that exists in, within the Chinese American community. Um, so the earliest accounts of uh, people from this province coming here is from the 1940s, but the, uh, there was a growth, a huge explosion uh, from the 1980s onwards. So you would have uh, neighborhoods in, in Brooklyn, Manhattan, Elmhurst, Queens, Sunset Park that were mainly Taishanese speaking, Cantonese speaking. And if you go there today, it's mostly uh, Fujianese and or Mandarin speaking. Um, a lot of the people coming from this uh, province speak local dialects uh, as well as Mandarin. Um, 
the uh, Fujinese students rarely understand uh, Cantonese, and uh, the students' grandparents and parents, they might not speak that same dialect, or they might not speak Mandarin at all, so these linguistic problems are mostly ignored by New York City public school systems, because it generally lumps all Chinese students together. Uh, many of the uh, immigrants who came here come from uh, co uh, the countryside or rural areas. Uh, most of them are, are uh, male, and a lot of them are, have only achieved maybe like a junior high school, if a high school uh, level education. Very few are um, professionals. Um, a lot of these families, because of that, uh, they aren't able to uh, pay for certain things for their children, such as food or clothing. So the practice of sending their children back home to their province so that their relatives and or family members can take care of them during that time. Um, because they are mostly in agricultural work, uh, they're poor and less skilled when compared to other people within uh, uh, China. So a lot, a lot of these, uh, most of the people from the province are um, unlike uh, other groups. They're, they're mostly pro-PRC and they uh, will celebrate October 1st. Um, as stated earlier, the marriage and fertility rates, uh, younger rates of marriage, higher fertility rates, especially for uh, non-college uh, educated women. So as uh, Dr. Geeling was talking about earlier, uh, some of these families owe uh, snakeheads or groups uh, a certain amount of money to come to the U.S. and when they come here they work in uh, the food services industry or, or a restaurant and they have to work a certain number of years to pay down that debt and because it does take such a long time to do this uh, the financial burden and stress of taking care of their debts themselves and their children they feel that the best way to take care of their children is to send them back home so that they are uh, all their needs are met by their uh, by their relatives um, it's not uncommon for these families to spend anywhere from three to five hundred dollars a month to take care of their family members uh, because they know they can't they, uh, they can't raise them so I should also say that this practice has been booming within the last uh, two decades so uh, So, as I was saying earlier, very poor Fujinese parents uh, frequently send their one to six year old children back to their hometown. And one reason for this, as I said earlier, is to pay off their loans when they were smuggled in. A lot of them uh, possess very little knowledge of English. Uh, and when they come here, um, unfortunately, a lot of them face negative stereotypes. Uh, some uh, other groups within the Chinese community will refer to them as loud and crude or these countryside bumpkins, uh, and so they experience that uh, uh, discrimination on a, uh, on a regular basis, unfortunately. Now for the children who attend the schools, uh, they have difficulty adjusting to the new school system, and when they come back to the U.S., a lot of them, because they were raised uh, by their grandparents, they often weren't, uh, their educational needs weren't tended to. So when they came back to the U.S., having that structured setting uh, has been difficult for some of these students, especially uh, in terms of language. And if anyone, uh, anybody here knows about Bigs and Calps, a lot of these students' academic language is impaired. It takes about five years or so for uh, English to be utilized within an academic setting to be up to par. Uh, with their social language. So this, uh, this practice of sending children back to China uh, has been growing within the past couple of decades and the financial hardships uh, are, the families view these financial hardships as the, the greatest factor for sending them back, but the 
uh, disruption it causes to the children uh, during the attachment phase with their parents has long lasting effects and we've seen this in many of the interviews here. So. Language can also create certain emotional divides between family members, right? And so many parents want their kids to go to a Chinese culture school. And you can find quite a few schools, whether you're in Brooklyn Chinatown or Manhattan Chinatown or out in Flushing, right? Uh, to learn Chinese, especially written Chinese, requires a lot of rote learning because you have to learn these specific characters. Right? And so some of the uh, essay writers and interviewers would say things like, I don't really uh, speak Chinese better than maybe a six or seven year old kid. I can't really explain the more subtle emotional thoughts I have, uh, or they speak English, some combination of Chinese and English, and uh, they, in most cases, cannot read Chinese. Right? Some of the kids, however, are asked to uh, be involved in what is sometimes called language brokering, which means, and here's an example, an eight-year-old girl who has parents who don't speak a word of English, but she is pretty good at it, so the parents take this eight-year-old girl when they go to lawyers or tax accountants or whatever, and that eight-year-old daughter now has to translate whatever happens in the conversation, which may be truly above uh, what an eight-year-old uh, kid usually is supposed to understand and know, right? And, uh, and she grew up like this. Right? Some parents or outsiders uh, criticize their Chinese kids because they're not Chinese enough. Right. Uh, one not very nice expression, juxing, which means a hollow bamboo stick, uh, it really means that that person is cut off at both sides, like this hollow bamboo stick, but the person is hollow or spiritually weakened. Right? So the person is neither an American nor a Chinese in the eyes of some of the parents. Right? Uh, um, more common situation, however, is one where some of the American writers and interviewers say, sort of in an ironic way, I'm a banana, right? I'm externally yellow, but inside I'm more white than anything else, right? And they often sort of uh, make fun of themselves in that way. There's a strong emphasis on education in the Chinese American community, right? And let me repeat, it goes back to Chinese culture being extremely education oriented uh, for many centuries. And the idea is that since these parents made so many sacrifices, right? And especially so in the case of working class parents, right? Uh, it is up to their kids to uh, do extremely well because that makes the sacrifice of the parents worthwhile. The traditional Chinese uh, expression for this uh, is filial piety, right? a term that most of my students have never heard about. It's a very important term in the Confucian tradition. It means 
a sense of obligation that children have towards their family, their parents, and so on. Right? And it was sometimes considered to be the single most important virtue in this Confucian tradition. Right? At the same time, uh, the writers are quite optimistic about uh, what doing well in education will uh, bring about. Namely, they feel this is uh, the American dream, and if I only work hard enough, I can succeed and uh, do not only what my parents want, but also what they themselves hope to achieve in their lives. Right. One negative set of experiences had to do with reports about discrimination and racism. And there were quite a few essays about this. Right. Frankly speaking, and maybe that's not something that people want to hear, many of the parents are not too positive towards African Americans and Hispanics. Right? The writers themselves often do not share these prejudices. Right? But at the same time, if they grew up in a poor neighborhood, they were often themselves uh, made fun of. Right? And typical situations are racial slurs, you know, you're a chink or something like this or pseudo-Chinese uh, mock phrases, or sort of uh, making sort of physical gestures about the little kid's slanted eyes and so on. Obviously, if you're a little kid, that hurts like hell. Uh, others were told, hey, you all look alike, and you probably are a math genius, and so on and so on. Sometimes sexual gestures were made, and so on. In general, the more Americanized uh, writers and interviewees were most likely to suffer from this, whereas the writers that still lived in this Chinese world were less likely because they sort of felt themselves to be more Chinese than American, so it bothered them a little bit uh, less than these uh, more Americanized kids. Right. Gender roles was also a big topic. Generally speaking, and not surprisingly, parents supervise their daughters much more tightly than their sons. Right. But given the present uh, ethos in mainstream America, the daughters often weren't very happy about this. Right? If the family came from one of the big cities and was better educated, they were less likely to focus on traditional gender roles for their daughters. If they came from the more rural areas and had grown up some I'm talking about the parents now, some decades ago when China was uh, different than it is now, then uh, they often would be more pronounced gender roles for the daughters. Right. In some cases, there is also some pressure on the daughters, especially in the Fujianese community, to get married at an early age, which basically means that uh, they are not going to go to college or only for a limited amount of time. The writers also discussed uh, their body images. Right? And some of them, as they grew up, were unhappy that they were Chinese, perhaps because they were teased by others. Right? So they would look at their Barbie dolls, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, and say to them, how come I'm not like this? Right. And uh, so these body image problems were rather pronounced for some of, especially the female writers. The males wrote less about it, uh, in part, I think, because males, by and large, in their essays were less open. Right. So here's an example. 
uh, of one of the writers when she was a toddler. She poked one in the eyelid by accident, and so she had now one sort of slanted eye and one more round eye, right? And for her, that was a sort of symbol of living, so to speak, in the round eye environment, American society, and in the slanted eye environment, uh, the Chinese background, yet she had never been to China. And uh, she was quite unhappy. Uh, fortunately, later on, she started to uh, recover from this. And uh, as a college student, she sort of reconciled with some of uh, her background much better than when she was a small kid. Right? Skin color also plays an important role. This is an ad for Whitesimo cream. Right, uh, took the picture in Manhattan, Chinatown, and it's pretty obvious what the ideal is. Right? For instance, in Chinatown, you sometimes see people with an umbrella walking, you know, in July. The umbrella is for not being exposed to the sun so that your skin wouldn't darken. Right? And in Taiwan, also in South Korea, and so on, there's actually a sort of preoccupation with this topic. For the males, the problem is that you're not sort of, uh, you're not an American football player, right? So here you have a, a cartoon series, right? And I think it's pretty obvious that the picture that you see on the cover, Mr. Big Shot, right, is sort of an ideal and the 12 or 13 year old Chinese American boys who read this stuff, that's what they want to be. That's not what they are, but that's what they would like to be. Right. Next one. There were some uh, taboos in some families. For instance, uh, if uh, somebody had a Hispanic uh, boyfriend, the parents unhappy, told the daughter to uh, leave him, but they sometimes apparently said, they thought that maybe if that happens, uh, the boyfriend would kill her. Right. So some of the parents, this is the opinion of the parents, not the opinion of the uh, daughter, don't necessarily have a very realistic understanding of some aspects of uh, American society. Right? But there are, of course, uh, interesting exceptions. So here's one. Right? The daughter, when she was around 15, joined a high school wrestling team, which was basically boys. She was the only female. The family was adamantly opposed to this. Right. That's not what a daughter is supposed to do, yet she stuck with us. Right. She would get calls from her uncle who hadn't talked to her in years and say, what the hell are you doing? Right. And yet uh, she felt that I'm growing up here in the United States and this is my way of uh, growing up. Uh, let me briefly talk about education in uh, Chinatown and more generally in New York City. Right? This picture is taken in Brooklyn, Chinatown. Right? You see mom and her two daughters uh, looking at uh, various uh, schools, tutorial schools you could call them. Right? Quite a few of these uh, daughters and sons will later end up in these tutorial schools where they learn both how to do well on SAT tests but also uh, are being exposed to Chinese culture. So there may be a double purpose. Right? The biggest school of that sort is on Mott Street, right? CCBA. Uh, this picture is taken uh, on a Saturday afternoon. Those kids all had gone to classes. And let me repeat, some were tutorial classes, some were more Chinese culture classes, and they're being picked up by their parents. Right? 
Uh, CCBA has about 5,000 students, probably the biggest school of this sort in the United States. And these students also include Chinese American adults who want to learn English at that school. So it's not all for kids. So to become an educational dragon over the centuries has been an ideal. Right? However, these days, uh, female students outperform male students. That's true both for the Chinese American community but it's also true in many other uh, ethnic uh, environments. For instance, here at St. Francis College, about 59% of the students are now females. If you go, uh, I teach in an honors class, it's largely female students, right? So while the traditional ideal and the uh, examination, the imperial examination was for sons, not daughters, the reality in the year 2019 is quite different. And we can look for one moment at Stuyvesant High School, the most famous uh, competitive high school in New York City. And uh, uh, before we do so, uh, uh, let's look at a comparison. This is, again, taken from the book by Dr. Kazinitz. In the background, 73% is a percentage of uh, Chinese second generation, right? So they were born here in the United States, 25 and over who got a bachelor's degree. 73% among the Chinese, the highest percentage of these eight groups, and at the same time, the Chinese, 1.1%, had the lowest percentage of dropouts, right, from uh, high school. Uh, these are Data are based on uh, telephone interviews, so that may be slightly inflated for all of the groups, but it tells you something about the educational success of the Chinese and why Dr. Kazin had said they moved uh, farther away from their parents' uh, background than any other group. This uh, shows you the ethnic composition of three highly rated New York City high schools. Right? This is the year 2013-2014, but you may know that uh, just uh, weeks ago there was a big discussion about Stuyvesant High School and why there are so many Asian Americans and very few uh, African Americans and Hispanics. Right? So Stuyvesant High School used to be called a Jewish school. I have a friend who went there 30, 40 years ago, and he would, would sometimes say, I was the only non-Jewish person in my class. Right? Today, it's predominantly an Asian school, and then a white school, while Hispanics and African Americans are strongly underrepresented. Right? So these statistics still basically hold true today. So let, let's sum up. What do we find? There are about 650,000 or more persons of Chinese descent, right? about 7.5% of the city's population, about a quarter of the kids from that background uh, grow up in poor households. Right? The Chinese mostly come to the United States for economic reasons and to improve the educational chances of their children, because in China it's very difficult to get into a university, much more difficult than here, right? Uh, so they feel that their kids should have it better, and for this purpose they often make very intense and large uh, sacrifices. Right? The, uh, most of the children in turn are aware of these sacrifices, right? and uh, work very hard to, for instance, end up in a school like Stuyvesant or some other very good school. Right? In order to understand uh, what uh, goes on among these Chinese American kids, you have to look at a lot of different factors. Of course, here we only talked about a few of them. Right? Needless to say, you can go on with this stuff for hours. Right? 
many of the Chinese Americans uh, think of themselves as Chinese. For instance, they talk about so mainstream Americans, they call them Americans. Right? On the other hand, there are also students who basically say, look, uh, I'm, a uh, I'm an American teenager. Yes, I come from this Chinese uh, background, but in reality my life is now more or less that of an American teenager. So there are very difficult and very different reactions to their situation. We talked about the language problems, right? Uh, the success of these Chinese youth in the educational areas, right? they do especially well if they do not join some of this sort of more fun-oriented aspects of Chinese mainstream culture, which uh, would lead them to uh, a more independent life, but also one that in in terms of education and other ways, probably will be less successful in quite a few cases. As far as the parents are concerned, a good child is a child that's an academically oriented child. These are some of the people that helped us, because it's a rather big study. Some are here from St. Francis College, some uh, come from other areas. So, uh, Mr. Palumbo and I would uh, thank you for all of your attention on behalf of all those dragons <laughs> and the phoenixes. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Are there any questions for our speakers? Well, if there are not any questions, I have got two certificates of recognition to Juve and Jonathan. Thank you so much for this highly informative uh, presentation. Thank you so much.